Welcome to A Thousand Tiny Steps. I'm Barb Higgins, and in this podcast, I'll share personal stories of great joy and tragedy and the steps that brought me there. I have become adept at tracing them backward to find the origin of an event, good or bad, that has affected my life. I have gone from being on top of the world with Division I All-American success to being unable to get out of bed with the grief of losing a child and everything in between. I am painfully honest, which can make people uncomfortable, but discomfort brings growth and oftentimes tragedy brings joy. So tie, buckle, slip on, release up your shoes and join me as we begin our thousand tiny steps. Hey everybody, Barb Higgins here. Episode 14 of my podcast, A Thousand Tiny Steps. Episode five of season two. Season two was all about Molly, what she was like, what losing her was like, and what life has been like after losing her. I ended my last podcast at her big musical celebration, the, the community-wide celebration of her life that to this day is overwhelming to think about. Every time I go into that theater now, I think of Molly. It's hard not to. And it was a huge piece of my survival at that time to know that that many people came to send Molly off to live in heaven and to have a piece of her to remember. I get humbled sometimes and speechless. It's hard to, it's hard to think back on those days without building up that panic that was in my stomach. And if I had to use a word to describe how I felt at that time, it would be panic stricken. I talked about when I wake up in the morning, I was sleeping on the living room floor, which I'm looking at from here. And I had to jump right up out of bed. I couldn't for one moment truly think about what was going on in my life. In my day-to-day activities were nothing. Really, I never left the house. I never left the yard. It was a really sunny, hot summer. And I sat in a chair. I was so tan on the front of me, so white on the back. I just sat in a chair. I couldn't function at all. I was in panic. I was in complete shutdown mode. So May 23rd was, was the memorial. April 23rd was the day I left for Amsterdam. So... In one month's time, I had an amazing vacation that upset my children and their dad. I came home thinking my biggest problems were my marriage. Well, I actually haven't been married for a long time, but my relationship to Kenny and my relationship with Roy and this the negative impacts of this new job I had. I worked at a very, very prominent special ed school, and actually the teaching part of that job was phenomenal. It was very, very overbearing and, and actually swallowed me up quite a bit. I worked hours and hours starting this new school. It cost me my job at VLAX, which I'm working again at VLAX, which is kind of a nice relief. And it put incredible strain on my family. Molly and Gracie were angry at me all the time for being away. And Kenny and I were struggling. And so I was away. I was sleeping away a lot. Anyway, I slept at my sister's. My couch served quite a bit. And all of this was on my mind. When I walk in out of my house, we have a back porch and you go out the kitchen door and it's two or three steps to the screen door of the porch. And I remember clearly one day walking out that door. It was about two weeks before Amsterdam, so mid-April, and just saying to myself, my life can't go on this way. Something's going to explode. And I truly thought it was me. Either my family life here would explode, my relationship with Roy would explode, or my relationship with the school and the people there would explode. I just didn't see how I could balance everything that I was trying to balance. Always in my life, I've been a bit of a people pleaser. And I can remember one time, a good friend of mine, Jack Frazier, hi Jack, if you're listening, calling me selfish. And he goes, you're the most selfish person I know because I didn't have time. He wanted to have dinner or to do something. And I was too busy. And I thought to myself, selfish, I spent my whole life doing things for other people. And what he meant was that sometimes I put my energy into doing things for the wrong people. Not that anybody is singularly wrong as a human being, but that I'm mistreating those that are most important to me to help people that aren't as high up in my life. I, I don't know how to explain it better than that, but I think people will know what I mean. Oftentimes children from abusive and traumatic childhoods spend their lives running around trying to make everyone's happy because if everyone's happy, nothing bad will happen. And so I'm quite sure my supervisors at that job, Kenny, Roy, a lot of my friends thought I was taking care of everyone else. I remember in the week before leaving to Amsterdam, I went to the Boston Marathon with Robin. That was this entire long day I was gone from my family. I went to a Red Sox game with my friend David the day before that. I was gone all day. That, you know, I, was, I just look back now at the hours I spent away from my family. And mostly I regret not being with Molly. I'm talking about this now to set up the mindset I was in after the memorial service when, when everything had settled down. Kenny and Gracie and I just stumbled through the days. So there was nothing left to plan. I just would, so I'd wake up and I'd sit 
Robin Grant would come over all the time. She came over every day. She'd sit with me in the yard. We had no swimming pool that year. The year before it was, you know, we had to throw it away. We get a new one every two or three years. It's one of those Intex blue pools that blows up and we, we needed one. So we finally found one and I remember setting it up. Oh, I set it up myself, blowing up that tube. I couldn't find the, oh, so I blew it up with my mouth. Anyway, we, we started filling the pool. I have some wonderful pictures of, of some friends of Gracie's coming by, Derek Taylor and Megan Nyan and jumping in the water. It was maybe half full in their clothes. It was a really, really hot end of May, beginning of June. And once the pool was set up, it gave Gracie a vehicle through which to invite friends over and have something to do that was outside, that was fun. Those sort of mundane things are what filled my day. But mostly I was in an utter state of panic. I had not spoken. I quit my job at the school. I stopped working there. I, I couldn't function at all. And so I just quit. The sort of business manager of the school was not unhappy at all that I quit. She was quite pleased, actually. So I severed ties with with the school and the people there, which was probably a healthy step at that time. I needed to I needed to cut ties. I also know that Gracie was in this sort of euphoric She'd get up and who's coming over today and what are we going to do? And I remember saying to her once, you don't seem very sad. And she goes, of course I'm sad, but right now I have all these people taking care of me. I'm going to take advantage of it. And she was right. Life would go on much sooner than we thought. And we would realize starkly that our journey would be very different from everyone else. So if I had to describe the end of May and all of June, it would, would be tying up loose ends from Molly's death, waiting for the medical reports to come back to see if the tumor was cancerous or not. Sorting through cards. Every day the mail was just full of cards. Sorting through cards, trying to thank people for donations, transferring the donation money in and paying bills that we hadn't looked at in two months, maintaining Kenny's health. Kenny had to continue with dialysis. You know, so his medical treatment couldn't stop. So that routine for him continued. So now he spent his four hours at dialysis, you know, thinking about Molly and a lot of things. Our house was full of food and people would come by all the time. And so Really, I compare my experience to like an earthquake or a tsunami. So a big wave comes and decimates the town. And while the wave is decimating the town, you're drowning. And I would say that would be the 48 hours that Molly was maybe going to wake up, maybe not. And I still couldn't even functionally believe that, you know, five days prior, I was in a foreign country and having a wonderful vacation. The stark difference in my life from April 30th to May 1st really was like a brick in the face. And I sat and I sat and I sat and I was just stunned, stunned into complete paralysis emotionally and mentally. I would eat whatever was in the kitchen. I would wait until five o'clock and then drink. When you drink regularly, intoxication takes on a whole new level. I, you know, sometimes we think about being drunk as you go to a bar and you're with friends and you get shit faced. And that that's one kind of drunk. My kind of drunk wasn't like that. I think I drank the drinks slowly enough and spread them out long enough that what it did was it just numbed me down. I couldn't sleep. I remember, I remember that was the hardest thing for me was sleep. And I didn't know what to do and how to function. I was just, just sitting amongst the rubble, looking around, wondering where are my, where are my things? So much else happens when you lose a child or have a traumatic loss like this. Life doesn't pick up where it left off because somebody that should be in it is missing. Now I understand When an elderly parent passes away, when Kenny's dad died, Kenny was devastated and it was sad because all these things he would never do again. He would never see his dad again. He would never go buffing again. His dad was 86 years old. At 86, you've lived your life. You've lived a long, good life and you expect your parents to die. So there wasn't a big future that was suddenly decimated by the loss of Kenny's dad. Yes, he wouldn't get to see him anymore, but he didn't see him a lot anyway. And and it wasn't like somebody you woke up with every day. So everything that went on, everything that happened. So after the Molly B. the Musical, there was dance recital rehearsals and the dance recital itself. Well, Molly was supposed to be there. You know, she had been at the last competition April 4th and then she died. And so now Concord Dance Academy continues on because that's what happens. And Molly wasn't there. I remember that recital was incredibly painful. The sweetest thing is they left Molly's spot empty. They didn't re-choreograph the dance to fill her spot in. And that was incredibly helpful. Gracie received her trophy, her 11-year trophy. Molly started dance at age two. She'd been there 11 out of her 13 years. So, you know, these these things were tremendously helpful, but gut-wrenching. Then that ends. And then Gracie never went back to school. She went back to school for one day to visit. And the teacher, thinking she was doing the right thing, told them to, you know, not make a big deal about it. Just be, just be normal, or you know. And so Gracie walks into a silent classroom. And what she wanted was everyone to run up and hug her and ask, are you okay? And so she sat, she sat there just feeling stupid. You know, like 
you know, and it wasn't the fault of the teacher. People don't know how to, people don't know how to re respond to this. It is really, really hard. She had a, another staff member at the high school that stopped by frequently and just pushed her and pushed her and pushed her to experience her anger and talk about it. And Gracie needed to do it in her own time. You know, she needed to sort of process it through. Also at this time, Roy and I were meeting. We He came up several times. We'd go for walks and drives. We'd go out to eat. We went for lunch a couple of times. And, you know, from his perspective, I see it. You know, my life is decimated. What What does this mean now for us? And I don't know. It was That was probably one of the hardest things because I was truly committed to keeping my kids' family life, day-to-day -day life consistent and normal and everything. And things with Roy had been so volatile that I didn't see how that would be possible, how it would be possible for me to leave Kenny and Gracie and start a life with Roy or continue a life with Roy or tell Roy goodbye and stay with, stay with Gracie and Kenny. I couldn't wrap my head around it. And so I just needed time. And I think if I had had more time, a few months maybe to just really settle, do what needed to be done, my life might be very different right now. And I know probably Kenny and Gracie wouldn't want to hear that. A lot of people in my family might not, but my truth and my reality and my suffering and the death of my child is that I lost an awful lot. About mid-June, Roy began to say, look, you know, I, I can't do this. I can't just continue. And I get it. He was, this was traumatic for him too. And he was living his life alone and you know, working and flying and all the things that he does. And so those conversations began to be quite difficult. And we'd speak on the phone and he was relatively insistent. And I would sit in the drive. I remember one conversation, I'm sitting in the driveway and I'm just sobbing. And I'm looking at Gracie curled up on a blanket. And I'm looking at Kenny sitting in a chair. And I'm looking at my mother, looking at my weeds in the garden that I haven't touched. And I didn't know what to do. I just really was completely helpless. In that time as well, my mother came over quite a bit. Kenny was the one that functioned most normally. He just sort of continued his daily routine. He's really good at being a clock puncher. You give him a schedule, you give him a list of tasks, he gets it all done. Very, very efficient that way. And I think that personality trait helped him. Gracie remained swallowed up in her friends. And that was really, really helpful. It's helpful for them as well. So May turns into June. So we're two or three weeks out from Molly B. the Musical. I finally call the surgeon's office to say, look, I haven't heard yet. Was that tumor cancerous? So I call and say, look, this is Molly's mother and I really need this information. And so a surgeon calls me back. It wasn't Dr. Bauer. And he lets me know that Molly's tumor was indeed not cancerous at all. It was a harmless benign astrocytoma, which is a very common benign tumor. They're known for having a hard shell, but they're typically very easy to remove. They come right out. I remember getting this news in my car on Main Street. I had just had coffee with John Breslin. So John is a wonderful friend of mine who's who lost his son, Nat, in 2011. And I remember trying to be helpful to him. And then when Molly died, boy, did he know everything to say. And we had just had coffee at the works in Concord. And I sat and sipped my coffee and he just talked about it. And he was where I am now. He was in his fifth year, actually entering into his sixth year. And so I see now, now I can really understand the things he was saying, but I was in such a shock. I couldn't imagine a day without Molly, let alone being alive five years later and not having had her with me all this time. I went into my car and I saw there was a message from the hospital. And so I called back and that's when I got the news that her tumor was non-cancerous. So as has been often in my recovery with Molly's death and my response at the time, I began to scream, scream, that, that guttural loud scream. But I'm in a car on downtown Concord and I start pounding the, the steering wheel. So people are looking at me funny and everything else. And so I called an attorney. I have at that time as well, people had, had asked me, was I going to file a lawsuit because a perfectly healthy girl spending 16 hours in an ER and then dying of a ruptured brain tumor, you know, didn't seem plausible. <laughs> like, what, like, where was, what went wrong here? And at that time, I couldn't even think straight, but I knew that I wasn't ready to just accept her death. So I'm screaming and yelling and screaming and yelling. And so I call an attorney that a friend had recommended. And I just shared with him the fact that this wasn't cancerous. And, and his response to that was, this is going to sound very, very crass, but has she had a glioma or a glioblastoma? or a very, very cancerous brain tumor. Lawsuit-wise, if I were to say, she, if you had taken better care of her, she would be alive, they could fight that she wasn't going to live anyway. And it sounds disgusting, but when I get into the details of what lawsuits are like, you'll see that <laughs> that's the least disgusting. An astrocytoma, a perfectly harmless tumor that 12 hours earlier could have been removed, laid out a much different story. And I was just so angry. And I was just angry that we couldn't have donated all of her organs. Kenny needed a kidney. and Molly. He could have had one of Molly's kidneys. We love the kidney he has now. Rachel's kidney is a gift. But, you know, Molly's kidney would have been a gift as well. And it would have been a helpful way for Kenny to have a piece of Molly with him forever. 
So I called Robert Hitchcock and said, I want medical records and I'll come get them. And so they, they said, okay, you know, there's 800 pages, but pages and pages. I didn't care. I just wanted the medical records. I also went to Concord Hospital and got those medical records. And I went to Concord Pediatrics and got those medical records. And I went to the chiropractor and got those. I just decided I wanted all of Molly's medical records. I wanted all the information. That was in the very beginning of June. And I remember, Kenny doesn't say much. Sometimes he'll do whatever I ask. I have to be very careful not to take advantage of that because it can be easy to do. I get frustrated sometimes because I'm the kind of person that just takes it all on and does it myself. But I have to be careful about that as well. So the lawsuit was really in my mind. I didn't talk about it to too many people. My friend Robin talked about it quite a bit. And she encouraged me to consult with a friend of ours who's an attorney, Lenora. And so around this time, I put a status on my Facebook page about hating Concord Hospital and hating doctors and everything else. And so, well, hating the hospital and hating doctors and so many others involved in Molly's care. And she asked, would I like to go to lunch and, and catch up and maybe have some legal advice? And so I said yes, because I needed to know what to do and what was the right thing. Roy was very supportive. If any of you out there listening know Roy, he's a doer. If something goes wrong, he gets right on it to fix it. And so I think he felt that this was a positive a positive way for me to channel my grief was to make it useful. It was helpful at the time, I will say. So the month of June was processing the reality that Molly could be alive again and again and again, getting information, collecting all of her medical records, deciding on an attorney. And I had two or three different people suggest attorneys to me. Kenny and I visited three, and I'll get to the, that piece in a minute. In between that time, as we were making appointments to meet these different attorneys, one in Boston and two in Manchester, I had the nicest visit with Molly and Gracie's pediatrician. So the other horrible thing about children dying is not, not everyone knows, and so appointment reminders come up. I had scheduled a photo shoot for Molly, and the photographer called and said he couldn't wait to photograph that beautiful face, and I have to tell him she's dead. Chiropractor called Kenny to say, Why is it? Why aren't you here at the appointment? And Kenny had to say, Because we're at the hospital and Molly has a brain tumor and she's probably going to die. And the chiropractor cries. These were the things that were happening in the weeks and the first month or so after Molly's death going into June. Concord Pediatrics, where Molly had gone, I met with Dr. Nathan, her doctor, and Molly Gracie's doctor. And our last physical there the year before, we had so much fun. He was the most phenomenal doctor. Molly and Gracie loved him. And so we sat on a picnic table and talked and talked. It was actually really, really cathartic and helpful. I cried. He cried. We talked all about their lives. And when she was born, we have video of him saying, hi, Molly, and all the things that you do when a newborn baby is born and the doctors come up and say hi. So all of those things were memories for us. And we had really, really good closure there. And, I, you know, the hardest part of deciding on a lawsuit is there can be no apologies and no coming together and saying, gee, this was a terrible thing. It becomes very, very, very divisive, us against them. And in some cases, it should be us against them. And in some cases, it's just sad. And although I can't really go into any of the specifics of who I named in a lawsuit and, and what was said, I will say it was like earning a master's degree in a lot of things. <laughs> Self-defense, law, justice, what's true and what isn't, you know, how to spin a tail. I will tell you, I, I, I witnessed so much about the legal profession in this experience, that the ugly side of it. So all of those things were happening. Kenny and I took Gracie and her friend Erin to Long Island. We drove down to Bridgeport in Connecticut and went over to Long Island and saw the, the Dolan twins. They were a YouTube brothers that had this show and it was hilarious and they were famous. And Gracie and Erin had a blast and I had bought four tickets and I gave them to Gracie on her birthday when she was so upset I was leaving. I said, well, I have these great presents for you. And I printed out the Dolan twins tickets and I had four of them, one for Gracie, one for Molly, and each of them could bring a friend. And so... You know, we thought of bringing two more kids because we had the tickets. Kenny and I didn't want to sit in there and watch the Dolan twins. So we didn't. So Gracie and Aaron went in and they took their two pieces of paper of the extra tickets and put them on the seats next to them. And, and they enjoyed the show. Again, a surreal, a surreal experience, like what to do, what to do. In that time, I also chose my attorney. So I'll leave the attorney's names out of it and I'll, I'll leave any of those details out. I will say the attorney that we chose was phenomenal. He was kind. He knew everything about Molly. He did his research. He understood the nuances. He understood the emotions. And so that journey began. That was all in the month of June. Also during the month of June is school ending and Gracie figuring out how I'm going to pass my classes and what assignments to get in. And it took her about two years to finish her freshman year. Quite honestly, it was one of those things. And Kenny, I don't have a lot of strong memories of Kenny during this time because he really was just getting up and going to the hospital for dialysis and coming home and oftentimes going to bed. While we were away on that trip to New York, Robin and her daughter Maddie planted the beautiful garden, which is right outside my window still. Beautiful, beautiful plants and perennials. And the summer sort of tick-tocked on. We just tried to make it 
manageable. End of June, beginning of July, dance is still going on because we're going to the nationals. I remember Molly was so excited to be competing in a national competition. She just loved it and thought it would be a great thing and had great experiences in prior national competitions for tap dancing and all the things they did. And this one was in Providence, Rhode Island. I mean, it was in mid-July. And so the last week of June and the first weeks of July involved two pretty stressful things. One was that I was going to miss the Bill Ludi Road Race. I made the t-shirts pink and we put Molly, hashtag Heart Molly B on them. The dance competition was at the same time as the road race. So I had to miss the road race. And I remember my fellow race director being furious with me, like, you know, so you can't he just take her? You can't miss it. And, you know, I was just, I just was sort of dumbfounded, like Molly just died. And I remember it was his wife who said, you know, how sad have we been over losing our cat, you know, and, and you want her to miss Gracie's dance competition. So he called me back like an hour later and said, I need to send me straight. You're right. So I had to spend a lot of time working to make sure everything was covered because I do like 50 million things on race day. That was super helpful. That took up a lot of time. The other thing was, this was really the end of whatever Roy and I had at that time. It wasn't, I guess, in looking back, it wouldn't have been fair of me to to string them along like this, to wait till I somehow feel better. It took me a long time to feel better, quite honestly. But I really, it was sort of 100%. I remember, you know, he just really, he gave me this beautiful painting of Molly and we tried to wish each other well and, and move along. You know, for someone who hates to be alone, my fear was that he would just find someone else and forget about me. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. And it wasn't a negative thing, but these are the things that you lose when you lose a child. I remember going to Providence and we were at the big convention center there and there was this really cool exhibit on the human body. And we had dinner at a restaurant called The Melting Pot and it has this tender, tender place in my heart. All these things just, you know, bring back Roy. And, and it was really hard for me. And I remember sitting at that table surrounded by Gracie and Kenny and all the dance community and, and feeling like a square peg in a round hole. But I also know that when I was away and not here, and trying to think about starting a life now with Roy. I share this because I know I'm not the only one. When I'm in my grief groups, these stories come up of these painful, painful experiences that people have. And so July was missing a road race that was dedicated to my coach and saying goodbye to somebody I really cared about. There were some details about that that are incredibly painful that I think are probably too personal to be in a podcast, but there were times when I was painfully close to Roy, physical proximity, and didn't know it. And found out later, and thought to myself, oh my gosh, I could have walked 10 feet that way or a half a mile this way. Those things are always hard. You know, the what ifs, the what ifs, the what ifs. July and August were, were incredibly numbing times. I started to really, really drink heavily. I asked my psychiatric nurse practitioner, you know, my therapist, to up my meds because I wasn't making it. And I began to dabble in using a lot of other drugs that were very, very dangerous and could really hurt me. And that story is for a podcast episode of its own, which I think I'll tell maybe in the next season. But I will say that it's not just people living under bridges and people who are homeless. There are some very, very wealthy, upper-class, unhappy people that rely on chemicals <laughs> to be happy. And I became very, very sucked into that community for a long time. But at this time, I was just really trying to wrap up all of these loose ends and, and make things okay. I had Princeton camp, and Princeton camp was something that was really, really important to me. I did track camp and that was the third week of June. So I was still deep in the claws of grief. I made Gracie do a play. She did Elf with RB Productions, who we, were, we sponsor now. Because if she was going to make me do tra track camp, she needed me to do it so that I would be busy, so that things would seem normal. And I did. I had 150 people at track camp and we had a blast. And we started the Molly Mile, which is a new tradition, and wearing pink on Thursday. And you know, Gracie did Elf and she did that play. And, and then she worked at James and the Giant Peach, the other play that she and Molly were supposed to do. I went to Princeton camp and it was very hard for me to be away. So I only stayed for three days, but I went down. It was the last year of Princeton camp, another chapter of my life closing. It just seemed that with every step, tick tock, tick tock, every step of that summer, something else disappeared. You know, each little piece of my life, you know, the day of Molly's entrance into the admission into the ER, I had a full-time job at a school. I was separated from Kenny. I was seeing Roy. I was working hard. I was working out finally again and training. I had a million things going on, raising Gracie and Molly, going to their plays, going to dance, and it just blew up and stopped. I just read an article about a woman who, when she was a little girl, she lost her house in a fire. The family got out, but everything was burned. Everything, the entire house and everything in it. It was so badly burned and incinerated that they couldn't even 
tell why the house burned down in the first place. And she talked about how traumatic it was to lose everything. You lose your, you lose perspective. You don't know your place now because there's nothing to show where you've been or where you were going. Everything was just gone. And even though that was just a house and things, it was that little girl's whole entire life. And, and she talks about how that trauma still affects her. And that's how I felt. I felt like I was looking at familiar things. I was looking at dance competitions. I was looking at Roy on Facebook. I was looking at Kenny across the room. I was looking at Gracie curled up on the floor. I was looking at my mother and all of these new versions of these people existed in the four walls that looked unchanged. It was such a psychologically difficult place to be. And oftentimes I felt ringing in my ears and I felt tingly sometimes. And like I was standing next to myself, it was utterly, utterly foreign to me. And that, that feeling lasted for a long time. Although we were, although we were separate and apart and not talking all that much, Roy remained pretty supportive. He sort of had to eliminate my existence. I had to disappear in his life for him to sort of move on. And again, I guess that's what he had to do. But so much of my life had disappeared. To not be able to go onto his Facebook page and see our Amsterdam vacation because he had taken it off was really, really difficult for me because I hadn't put much of it on mine. But there again, maybe that's me being the same way, you know, having this hidden sort of thing. I went round and round. The other thing I did that summer in, in the months that followed was to find us all therapists. Kenny was very reluctant. I don't need a therapist. It's not going to help me. I don't need to talk about stuff. But he went for a handful of appointments and, and didn't get much out of it. I took Gracie to three different women and had her do an appointment with each. And she chose one that she likes that she still has. And that was the most important thing to me. Gracie was in therapy early July. So just not even two months after Molly's death. And then I started therapy, I would say in August or September of that year, I found this wonderful therapist and she was phenomenal. Again, life-saving things. And you start this process of now I'm in therapy because I lost my child or I lost my sister. All of these months, all of these months, I will say, felt like sitting in a ragged torn shirt and dirty pants in the middle of rubble, waiting for somebody to bring me something. I just didn't know how to function. At the same time, people were putting on little events for us and, and little parties and get-togethers. And, you know, there were concerts that Molly would have played in and would I come with her pink violin. And, you know, I did all of these things. I just had to go through so many motions to putting on track camp, all of those things. I, I was really just doing it like a zombie or like I was in a dream. You know, it was just painful. Gracie spent that summer. I, I'm not inside of Gracie's head, but I do know that she really busied herself with friends. But as summer wore on, things slowed down. People's lives resumed. They stop coming by so much. They, you know, two or three days go by and they don't call and ask how you are. And again, you can't fault people for this. I will say Robin didn't fault her once. She was day by day, you know, and then if she had something to do, she would always just tell, I'm not, I can't see you tomorrow. Is that okay? Well, of course it's okay. You, know, you have to live your life. Fourth of July was really quiet. We, were few, we didn't do any holidays that year. And we tie-dyed the rest of the track camp t-shirts because I had a bunch and I had tie-dye in. I remember Terry Cormier came over. She's a childhood friend. And I think Michelle, her sister, and they tie-dyed shirts with us for a while. And Keisha and Rebecca and Elaine came over and they tie-dyed shirts with us. You know, we just had so many memories of these things with Molly that at that time, early in grief, you want everything to be the same, or I did. So I wanted these things to continue. I wanted Molly and Gracie, Molly and Gracie. I wanted Gracie to continue to have what she would have had otherwise. And so we marched through the summer. If anyone has suffered a traumatic loss like this, and again, I'm going to go back and say, if it's the biggest loss you've had and it was unexpected, then it's traumatic in a similar way. And sometimes they're mind numbing. I think child loss probably takes the longest to get over. That wonderful doctor that gave us the news about Molly not waking up with a white beard, he told us that, please be prepared for five years. Give yourself five years. And I'm looking at him on May, May 3rd in the evening, Tuesday evening, May 3rd, and just looking at him like five years? I, I don't think I can live till tomorrow. And that's another piece of grief for me. I, I still have a hard time when people say, well, what about this or we'll do that next year? I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about the future. It's too painful. All, all I can do is stay where I am right now. If I think about tomorrow feeling the same way I feel now, I can't last. And so the five year is pretty accurate. Gracie and I talk about that sometimes now, how five years and now we're just sort of feeling some normalcy in our lives. And Kenny would agree as well that you start to sort of be like, okay, I can enjoy a sunrise and not be panicked by it. Okay, I can find happiness and not feel guilty. Okay, I can go four months in a row and never once think of the first of the month as a bad day or the seventh as a death day. These things take time. But at that time, all we thought about, all I thought about was Molly all the time. Summer marched along, again, tying up things. We began our lawsuit process. And I will say that was super, super helpful. 
again, channeling my grief into something that felt useful. I will tell you, I had many people warn me against it. Don't do it. It's ugly. It's just going to drag out your grief. But I couldn't just sit and do nothing. I mean, when I look back now at, at the warnings and the people that gave them, I know what they didn't want me to do is suffer anymore. I'm suffering today. As I give this podcast, I'm suffering. It was also at this time that I found online grief support groups. And these grief support groups are phenomenal. My favorite is called Ellie's Way. And I've talked about Ellie's Way before and Todd Nigro and his family and how they started this group for people that had suffered trauma. He lost a child, Ellie, to an in-home accident. Talk about something that could decimate your family. And that group is is phenomenal. And I look at some of my women friends in this group and the suffering that they have and how hard they work to feel better. We just lost a woman, Karen Beasley. She was one of the earliest ones who reached out to me because I was new and suffering. And she was this phenomenal woman who who had a baby at a young, young age and lost that little baby to SIDS like two months later. And she was, you know, 16 years old at the time. And now in this group, she's in her 60s and, and she remembers it and tells that story. You know that she thinks about it all the time. And she only had two months to get to know her baby. And that was her whole life. And she had a lot of other traumas. This woman spent her life helping us in Ellie's way. There are little regional Ellie's Way groups. I've gotten together in person with people that I've met in these groups. I don't know how I would survive. I have another one called Child Loss, Our Children in the Stars. And I have this wonderful friend, Kathy. She lost her daughter, whose name is also Molly. And we have a lot of connections. We know relatives of each other's and each other's families. I've talked about her before. Sometimes I don't even need to speak to her. I can look at her page and read her feelings and respond to them or not and take great solace and comfort in her knowledge and intuition because I get it and she gets that I get it. And when I post things, she gets it. And I think that's the, one of the biggest things. There's a woman named Lisa and she lives in the middle of the state of the country. And her daughter, Marilee was Molly's age and died of brain swelling, you know, similar, similar physical things. And she died suddenly and very quickly. And it was devastating, painful for them. She had that traumatic death and Marilee is beautiful. I see pictures of her all the time. And I look at her and look at her. At that time was when I also met ER. Big Ed, and he was, he's Vinny's dad, and Vinny died three years before Molly and hit by a car. I've talked about all these children before. They came to me in my little brain thing. And, and then, of course, Brandy, who's my sister for life, and her son, Jack, who drew me immediately. And now I have my Jack. All of these people in their trauma, and there are so many more I can mention. There's a woman named Sonia that I've mentioned her before, too, and she lost two children within a few months' time, two adult sons, David and Izzy. How do you ever come back from that? You know, it's just... But they do. These women, these people do. They come back. There's a woman, Tammy, (laughs) Tammy Palmier. She calls Jack her little Jack Jack, and she's a hoot. And we have so much fun talking back and forth online. All of these women, and many more I'm not mentioning, and I'm sorry if you're listening and I don't say your name and you feel like I should. Every time I stop recording a podcast, I think of like 50 people I could have mentioned. But these support groups became invaluable to me, and I was on them all the time. And I read and read and read. And I would read people who were 10 years in. And I'd read people who suffered recent losses just like me. And I spent a lot of time on my phone. And for once, I felt, thank God for social media. I just wouldn't have, I don't know how I could have survived without it. The fall came and of course, school starts. And this was probably when Gracie's world came crashing down the most. Because there she is, I'm dropping her off at at Concord High School. And I'm going home and I'm sitting in the car because I cannot go in the house when Kenny's not there on the dialysis days because Molly should be there. This was my time where I would drop Gracie off, go back, and have 40 minutes with Molly to help her finish getting ready, to drive her to school. And there I was in an empty house. And I can remember so many times saying to myself, hi, Mama, in my head and looking up the stairs and saying, what is it, Molly? And there's no Molly up there. And I'd walk up the stairs and I'd walk into their bedroom. Those were some of the behaviors. Another key thing in those months, and when fall came, I had to readjust my thinking, is I couldn't go upstairs. I couldn't go into the bedroom. I couldn't go into the bathroom. Molly had spent so much time sick in those rooms that I couldn't function. I couldn't do it. So I just didn't bathe. You know, I I would run upstairs and grab clothes and run downstairs and change. I couldn't use the downstairs shower. I went into labor in that shower with Molly. And I'm sure this sounds like I'm a nutcase, and perhaps I am and was. But that summer, I I shampooed my hair in the driveway, and I put a bathing suit on and took a shower with the hose. I couldn't function. Like, I just couldn't. And sometimes I just couldn't even function. I didn't brush my hair. I just shoved it up into hair ties. I had little dreads back here. Every time people gave me jewelry, I got a lot of jewelry as gifts. I had like 15 necklaces on and five or six bracelets. I just put them on. It was just bizarre. I couldn't, it was, I can't, I can't imagine feeling that way now being that hobbled. (laughs) Hobbled is a good word. If you're a Stephen King fan, then you know, in the book Misery, the the protagonist hobbles the man in the bed. (laughs) But I felt hobbled. I was hobbled. My feet had been amputated. 
that's how I felt at that time. And all of these things, you know, really maintained their grasp on me and, and I think on Gracie through the beginning of the school year. Gracie really started to struggle. And I made it clear with her counselors that we would get the work done, but if she didn't want to go to school, I wasn't going to make her. And I think her sophomore year, she probably averaged two and a half days a week at school. I would say that would be about it. And she spent a lot of time when she was at school in her commons area with the sweet, sweet, sweet Mrs. Bozeman took good care of Gracie during that time. You know, when Kenny's situation marched on, as the holidays approached, we knew that we could not, could not function Christmas. So went on vacation to Hawaii with Lenora and John Bame, and they were one, they owned a home there. And I had gone there for Madison's wedding, Maddie Grant's wedding the year prior. So we had two weeks. Uh, it was rainy season, so we didn't get a ton of sun. We went to where the sun was, but we had two weeks in beautiful Hawaii, which was a lifesaver. We went to surf competitions. We went surfing ourselves. We went to waterfalls. We just went everywhere. They really showed us a wonderful time. We ate a ton of food. We drank tons of alcohol. I was drunk every night, which you know I don't say that to brag, but I couldn't, couldn't function. It was just the only way to do it. And that's how we made it through Thanksgiving. That was the year this beautiful molly tree was put together for us by Stacy Haggett and Emelina. And then we came home and we had three weeks of December here. We had the Christmas show. First Christmas show without Molly. The only dance Gracie was willing to do was Mother Ginger. She's the, you know, Mother Ginger who waves and the little elves come running out from under her skirt. That was the one thing she could do because she just couldn't face the Christmas music and the dancing. So dance for her that fall was incredibly difficult. Miss Cindy, in her efforts to alleviate pain, tried to tell people not to talk about Molly, but all Gracie wanted was to talk about Molly. She wanted people to wear their shirts. There were a couple of times that Gracie showed up and everybody was wearing their Molly B shirt. Again, with all of our incredible misery, people just reached out and tried to do the kindest things. We spent that first Christmas in Florida. We were driving on Christmas Eve, just driving on Christmas Day. So they just felt like other days. They didn't feel special at all. And we went to Amelia Island. And it rained and rained. <laughs> Gracie and I had to, we went inland a bit for sun and we went to some random hotel and sat by their pool <laughs> so that we could get a little sun. It was frustrating, but we weren't home. You know, we were just, we were away and it was good to be away. And we visited Kenny's sister in Naples and the weather was much better down there. We got some sunshine and then we drove home. And that was 2016. I remember that one of the last painful, painful things of that particular year was when it stopped being 2016. And now it was 2017. And this was a year in which Molly had never been alive. And that was another one of those milestones for us that was really, really painful. Roy was heavily involved in a new relationship. And for self-torture, I would look at his Facebook page all the time and see how much fun he was having and how happy he looked. And I was equally jealous and angry, you know, like, ah! But, you know, I would look at my own Facebook page and these plastered on smiles that we did and know that he could look at mine and probably feel the same way, that I was living some pseudo family life. And the reality was I was in the middle of a in the middle of a cyclone. Another person I met and actually had a weekend visit with is Wendy. Wendy grew up in Pennsylvania, actually is a good friend of Roy's. That's how we met. Wendy and I started, you know, we were, we communicated a little bit anyway before Molly's death. And then once Molly died, she reached out and we talked all the time because her sweet Haley died Christmas Eve. And then Molly died later in that same, you know, in May. So we were very close together in our grief. We had a wonderful weekend together. We went out to eat, drove all around. I showed her in Hampshire. We, <laughs> My favorite memory is we're all in the, in the pool and she looks out the window and she was still asleep and she came down and jumped on a float in her pajamas. It was great. But again, here's another mother that's lost a child and she's been, she's been a huge piece of my ability to survive grief because she's somebody that understands and knows. And I really always, always appreciate her perspective. And so again, as is the theme with every episode I take, in the middle of the worst, worst times comes great, great joy and gratitude. So the Christmas tree was a big piece of Christmas. And this was helpful for Gracie because that's her community, the Concord Dance Academy community. And so this is sort of how I have to be honest and say this sort of numb trauma is how life continued for us for a while. I didn't work. I still didn't work. I budgeted so carefully all of the donation money. We were able to live on Kenny's disability and, and the money we had received from donations. You know, I, I just couldn't function function seeing people. As we marched into 2017, I started tutoring at our local state hospital here and it was one student at a time and it was a student that was in a locked facility. So clearly they had issues going on, whether it was a mental illness or an abusive family. And I started to see that that trauma was pretty rampant, that a lot of people were upset and sad. But I remember then as well, they get buzzed in and then the door locks behind you. I had a good friend years ago that was in a locked facility. And when I went to visit her, the locking of the door freaked me out. I couldn't stand it. Now, this now made me comfortable. It was just comforting to sit one-on-one -on -one with somebody that maybe had it worse than me. 
and help them with their schoolwork and talk and figure out what's going on in their life and, and all of that. It was really super helpful. And we marched into the one-year mark. And that was, you know, there are people that think, you know, okay, year one, you should be done right now. You know, it's not that way at all. It was a year. And and I was equally glad that I had made it a year and horrified that I'd made it a year. I remember sitting on her grave at noon, which is when we unplugged her. And there was a handful of people around and it was sunny and it was just sort of terrifying that we'd been there a year and we had to start into the next year. So I think I'll end here. As anyone that suffered grief knows, you know, <laughs> a recall of events and a timeline of events is helpful and such, but also what does any of it really mean? You know, we, we get up and do things every day. I think if I had any takeaways out of this particular podcast, it would be that there are tons and tons of people out there that are willing to help. The support groups are phenomenal and there's all kinds of people in these groups. Some people really, really thrive in them. Others like me now sort of use them. I just sort of watch. I'm on the outside looking in a little bit. And I met some amazing people, people that I'll be friends with for the rest of my life. Gracie, I think her life just sort of stopped as it does sometimes for kids when they have trauma. When we look back on that year, both of us just cringe. Sleepless nights on the on the living room floor or nights I was passed out drunk and actually slept all night. That was pretty amazing. Really heavily relying on pharmaceuticals to, to maintain myself. I think back to the amount of medicine I was putting into my body and I wonder sometimes how I even functioned. But I think it speaks to how out of it I was and how utterly disastrously messed up I was and how looking into using prescription medications <laughs> at a huge level. You know, I have to say these medicines can be life-saving, but I, I began to rely on them heavily it's just to make it through the day. So I know this all sounds, you know, sad and, ugh, but we don't talk about it. You know, this whole pandemic and everything that we're going through with COVID, the upsetting life changes and how much people are struggling. There are times when I want to say COVID's nothing. And, you know, I feel that way sometimes. Big deal. I had to stay home. <laughs> I stayed home. I've been staying home for five years, but that's my reality. And I have a home that's safe. I actually remember in the beginning of the pandemic, it was hard because home is where I think about Molly. I'm looking around at things that remind me of her. The chandelier in my living room, it's all beaded, crafty. That reminds me of her. It's very princessy. Anyway, I just feel that we're all in a very traumatic place right now. Politics is traumatic. The racism is traumatic. You know, the sexism and gender bias is traumatic. All of it is just not okay. And then, and then even Molly, in her treatment, in the beginning of her illness and the assumptions made because she was a skinny 13-year-old girl, you know, it's just in that year, I started to, in my numbness, I tried to survive. I tried to do as much as I could. I officiated some indoor track meets. And that was helpful because you don't have to really talk to anybody. You're just busy all day running around. Those weekends were good. That was in the winter. You know, and then I did that tutoring. And so I was, I was stepping back into my life as best I could. I chose the people to associate with who I felt were most supportive to me and would give me the space to just grieve and not leave me and not, and not just disappear. I remember in the week that followed, in the week of vacation, the one year mark, April, 2017, when it was a year later from Amsterdam, Roy messaged and asked how I was. And I said, I'm okay. You know, I'm okay. And each day we shared posts about what we did that day on vacation. Because as traumatic as it had been, it was a really good vacation. And I think his attempt was to help me to feel good about it. Like, look, I know she died. But here's what we did on Monday. And here's what we did on Tuesday. And, you know, when I think back, I'm drawn to that country. And a lot of it is the Anne Frank connection. But it's a beautiful country with a really good mindset on life. Politically normal place. <laughs> and it was really phenomenal. I encourage anyone I know to go. If you're going to go to Europe, make sure that that city... Amsterdam is one of your choices. So that brought me to the end of the year and starting year 17 and year two without Molly and the challenges that that would bring. How do I end? Well, I end by saying I would appreciate everyone in the world not judging each other on how they respond to trauma. We're all different. Some of us put it inside and uh, in a box and just get busy with life and don't think about it. Others of us fill a pool with it and drown in it. And then everyone else is somewhere in between. And I just think that the best thing you can do for somebody that's grieving is to let them grieve. Ask, how can I support you in your grief? One of the best things done for me in that first fall when I was coaching at Bo was Libby's mom came, Catherine, and she laid down with me on the floor. She's in like normal clothes. And I, she came to see me. It was cross-country practice time. I should have been at Bo. I couldn't function. The AD there at the time, Mr. Kaufman, was phenomenal. And he understood completely, if you're having a day, just call. And he would make sure that the girls had a good practice. And he was so understanding and supportive in my grief. And 
she came by and laid on the floor with me. She just laid on the floor with me. We didn't talk about anything heavy, but it was a day. It was a beautiful sunny day. She was on that floor all day. I couldn't function. I just laid down. That gesture, it's five years later and I still remember. So clearly it was important. And all she did was lie down for half an hour with me and talk to me about whatever. And these are the things that you can do for people. Grieving people are often a bit erratic and don't make a lot of sense. I'm quite sure there are times still where people look at me like, oh, here she comes. That will be me forever. And I have a lot of reasons to be that way, I think. So in ending, just be, I know I'm redundant, be kind, be nice, blah, blah, blah. But I'll tell you right now, the best thing we can do on a day-to-day -day level, and if we all did this, now imagine now, every single person on the world, everyone, just doing nice things a handful of times each day, small, nice gestures, how much better off the whole world would be. Everybody would just be in a better place. You know, I talk sometimes about science and religion agreeing, and I, and I think I do that because I just think, I think of love and the energy that, that love creates when you're kind to somebody, the energy that that creates and how I feel like it's an actual tangible thing that holds molecules together. That's how I feel. I feel like the earth spins because the people on it love one another. And that might sound bizarre and erratic and, and extreme, but it's, I think in Molly's death, I've just come to realize that the days I feel best are the days I feel loved. And when I'm, when I don't feel loved or supported, I really do have a hard time and I fall apart. It really is difficult for me. Long story short, do some kind things for one another. Remember that Molly's mission was to make people happy. And while it's not our responsibility to make others happy, it's a gift. We have a gift that we can make others happy. And that's what we do in life. So in closing, Thanksgiving is coming up. As I give this, as I record the podcast, Thanksgiving is coming up. You'll listen to it a couple of weeks after. So I hope that you had a good holiday and that you survived Black Friday and all that that represents. And as always, you know, I, I end my podcast the same way and I, I need to give a shout out to the person. So when I taught at Concord High School, Bill Harbrick was an assistant principal for a while and he had been a PE teacher forever. And he did the morning announcements and every day he ended the morning announcements the way that I end my podcast. And I have a good friend, an important mentor and person in my life. <laughs> Bill Harbrick, this is for you. Have a good day, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening and for supporting A Thousand Tiny Steps. I hope you enjoyed the episode and will continue to listen. Feel free to leave a review and share my stories with your friends. Also, please reach out if you have stories to share. I love hearing from and connecting with my listeners. If you would like to know what I'll be talking about down the road, you can find me on Instagram at barb underscore 444, on Facebook as Barb Higgins, and at my website, www.1000tinysteps.com.